Welcome to today's edition of the Rush 24-7 Podcast. You know, it's interesting. you got everybody out there at NBC and, and uh, elsewhere to drive by media. I didn't know. Nobody knew about Matt Wauer. We're stunned, we're shocked, and yet it hasn't taken them long to find all these old clips of Lauer sexually harassing, sexually suggesting, taunting, what have you. I mean, they're all over the place now. How could they not have known? Anyway, folks, great to have you here, Rush Limbaugh. And the broadcast week continues. Here we are on Thursday. It's great to have you. Telephone number 800-282-2882. The email address, lrushbow at eivnet.us. Nancy Pelosi has called for John Conyers to resign. Now, I want to put on my liberal progressive media hat and tell you what this headline would be if it were a Republican woman suggesting that some guy resign. White woman of privilege tells hospitalized black icon to resign. If the news media treated Pelosi... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the way we get treated, white woman of privilege tells hospitalized black icon, perhaps in bad shape, to quit and get out. And here's another thing to consider. You cannot ask the black guy to step down and not the white guy. That's Franken. It's exactly right, Mr. Sturdley. She's not calling on Franken to resign. She'd probably say, well, he's in the Senate. I don't have anything to say about what happens in the Senate. I'm in the House. But it doesn't matter. If a white woman of privilege, and believe me, Nancy Pelosi has a lot of privilege out there, is going to tell some poor hospitalized black guy. Do you hear what James Clyburn said? James Clyburn said, I don't believe this. All the accusers are white. Who elected them? So Pelosi says Conyers got to go and Al Franken stays, even though there is a fifth accuser that has surfaced on Franken. Here is uh, Nancy Pelosi from her press briefing just this morning. Reporters said a fourth woman has come out accusing Congressman Conyers and uh, and more in your caucus are calling on him to resign. How come you haven't called on him to resign? Uh, the allegations against Congressman Conyers, as we have learned more since uh, Sunday, are serious, disappoint- disappointing, and very credible. It's very sad. Uh, the brave women who came forward are owed justice. Uh, I pray for Congressman Conyers and his family and wish them well. However, Congressman Conyers should resign. There you have it. White woman of privilege telling hospitalized black guy to scram. Now, Snurdly came in to me today. It was, I guess, about 40 minutes ago. He said, how did you know? How did you know? I said, what are you talking about? You told us on Tuesday the Senate was going to pass the tax reform bill out of this. You said they were going to vote for it. And I said, that's right, I did. How did you know? I said, it was just instinct. I didn't know anything. I hadn't talked to anybody. I just, I just knew that it was going to happen. Well, I felt, I felt, I thought that it was going to happen. So looking at why, did you hear what the New York Times did yesterday? I mean, everybody's trying to figure out, okay, why McCain and Flake have got nothing to lose here? I mean, if McCain and Flake want to continue to hammer Trump, it'd be easy to vote no on this thing and head off into the sunset of Arizona. And, and be at peace with themselves. I and mean, if they really hate Trump and they want to sabotage Trump, it'd be easy to say, no, can't vote for it. But they're both going to vote for it. Flake not running again, McCain not running again. So what explains this? Well, the, you know, the, the, the optimal answer to that is that these guys have finally seen the light after a year and gotten on board the Trump agenda. But that's just, that's a bit much to believe. But look at what, and I don't know if this is a factor, but it may well be because all of these people in the establishment turn to and look at the New York Times. And do you know what they did? The New York Times basically turned to Twitter and became a bunch of political activists. The New York Times editorial board tweeted all over the place yesterday. 
with the names and phone numbers of Republican senators that voters should call and tell them to vote no on the Republican tax bill. All day yesterday, the New York Times opinion page was sending out tweets that seemed to be from a campaign headquarters. They're not just telling people what's wrong with the tax bill. They're urging people to call their... Remember when I used to do that? No, I never did it. When I was accused of doing it, I'm going back now 25, 28 years. I have long been accused of artificially impacting and affecting the outcome of legislation because the media routinely accused me of telling you to call members of Congress. And I said, I don't do it. I am not an activist. I don't use this program for activism. My audience is smart enough to figure out to do this anyway if they want to. I do not tell people what to do. I don't even tell people what to think. I just don't give them much of a choice between right and wrong. And so here now, the New York Times come along, comes along and activistly urges people to get hold of these Republican senators and give them what for. Now, you may be saying, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal, yeah, we've known for a long time that the New York Times is the Democrat Party house organ. And we've known that the New York Times basically serves as a, as a pack. Uh, for the Democrat Party, but this kind of seals the deal, and it illustrates there is few, I mean, the, the feudal desperation out there, and it is climbing, it is mounting, it is effervescing, and it's overflowing. The frustration on the left, none of them can believe this is happening. They can't believe Trump is still there, and let's go to the audio sound bites. As Trump succeeds, as the nation improves, I mean, you have the stock market now past 24,000. 52 Republican senators say they are going to vote for the tax bill. The president is is succeeding on a number of levels, and with each new success, the Democrats mount a campaign that he needs to be gotten rid of under the terms of the 25th Amendment, that he is senile, that he is incompetent, that he's mentally unfirm, that he is out to lunch that he is simply suffering dementia. MSNBC, CNN, a number of other drive-by news outlets are once again raising this allegation. We have a couple of examples. Uh, David Axelrod, last night on CNN with Anderson Cooper. Question, Mr. Axelrod reports on Trump's seemingly reborn birther views and the Access Hollywood tape. You know what this is really about? Trump had the audacity to retweet some video of militant Islamic atrocities. And these original videos were posted by a far right wing, so called far right wing group in Britain. And as you know, inside the Beltway, it is simply not permitted and it is unacceptable to relate or try to relate militant Islam to terrorism. It is a religion of peace. There is no terrorism in Islam, and this is the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be, and Trump comes along and blows it to smithereens and retweets video of militant Islamic atrocities. And, of course, the establishment in the U.K., the establishment here, are beside themselves. This just isn't done. And in their world, this means Trump is losing his marbles. Now, this question here, you know, Trump's denying what they say he said on the Access Hollywood video. That's stupid. We all saw it. We've seen it. Trump's now saying it wasn't him. Trump's now saying it was doctored and made up. Trump is toying with these people, but they think he's losing his mind. And now his reborn birther views, those are related to militant Islamic videos and and uh, and other things. If you listen to Janet Yellen, Janet Yellen, who's outgoing chairman of the Federal Reserve, all of a sudden says she's having nightmares about the national debt at $20 trillion. As she's leaving, she never had a dream, much less a nightmare about it, when Obama was building it up. When Obama took orifice, the national debt was $12 trillion. When Obama leaves, it's 20 He nearly doubled it. And so Trump's right there with a tweet to Janet Yellen. 
hey, it's kind of interesting here that you didn't even notice it when Obama was doing it. And you're just not supposed to call these people out that way. And so when you do, when you call them out, when you retweet videos of militant Islamic uh, terror that prove that there is militant Islamic terror, these people, they're the ones that are coming unhinged, folks. The drive-by media, the left the Democrat Party, they're the ones coming unhinged, accusing Trump of it. So Anderson Cooper says, David Axel Rodney's reports on Trump. How concerned are you? The president seems to be operating in a different reality when it comes to any number of topics. I am concerned, Anderson, because I sat next to the Oval Office uh, for a couple of years. If the person who sits there is delusional, that poses all kinds of very, very frightening scenarios. And when you read particularly the things that he's saying in private, the denial of his own comments that were on tape, the rehashing of the the discredited birther uh, theory, going back to the votes in the election and the notion that he actually won the popular vote. These are delusional comments. It is very, very unsettling to think that the president of the United States would harbor them. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, to Mr. Axelrod, but this doesn't carry any weight. You guys have no ground to stand on. You, history revisionism. Trump is toying with you guys. Meanwhile, your accused guilty perpetrators of sexual harassment are coming out with some of the most convoluted, twisted apologies. You talk about being in a state of denial. Look at the full Franken. The full Franken is an apology technique that Al, I'm sorry, that, that, that Matt Lauer is attempting to to use partially, and it's bombing out. I don't remember it. I'm really devastated these women feel this way. I take a lot of pictures. You never admit it. You apologize for it, but you imply the women are lying. And this is going to come back and bite Frank, and it's going to get him in the end. They're doing everything they can to hold on to him, but in the process here, it's Trump who's losing his mind. It's Trump who's delusional. Here's David Rodham Gergen, same program. Anderson Cooper, David Rodham Gergen, they're saying this is no different than all of his words and how he shapes his own myths and creates his own reality. So what are we dealing with here? The president occasionally has to make really, really tough decisions uh, that are a matter of life and death. And you want a man of absolutely clear mind and able to absorb things. It's reached the point, Anderson, where I've been wondering whether his family and some of the top people in the White House ought to be conferring among themselves about what might be called in other ways uh, some sort of intervention and to really try to help him. An intervention! Oh, we love Trump so much, we want to help him. We care so much about Trump, we want to help him. We love our country. We really, we wanted to give him a chance. We've stood aside and we've let Trump be Trump, but now we've reached the point that we can't stay silent anymore. Trump must go. Trump's deranged. Trump's delusional. The nation is at risk. We might get killed. We're all going to die. The family has got to move in and intervene and stop the guy. Meanwhile, it was CNN that refused the White House Christmas party invite on Friday night at the White House. Uh, it's, it's, you know, folks, it's, it's fascinating to watch all of this. Who would have ever believed we would be here? It's November 30th. We are 11 months into the however many phony Russian collusion investigations there have been and are. We are 11 months into all of those investigations. Trump colluded with the Russians. They don't have a shred of evidence yet. Mueller obviously doesn't either, based on the leaks that are coming out of his investigation. Donald Trump is still president. Donald Trump is prospering. The Donald Trump agenda is on the move. There is a momentum and an inertia, and none of the people in the media, the Democrat Party had the wildest, I mean, their worst nightmares, this was not possible. This is the last place they thought they would be. Not only is Trump rolling and his agenda moving forward, they are imploding. The party that conducts accusations on the war on women is finding that all of its top name brand people are lechers.
You can't tell me these people have any idea that they were going to be here. Matt Lauer, Charlie Rose, Glenn Thrush, Garrison Keeler, Mark Halperin, Harvey Weinstein, three CNN editors, three NPR executives, two people at the New Republic are out of work, and Donald Trump isn't. Donald Trump is still there, and the tax bill cleared the Senate, or will when they have the vote. Al Franken is floundering and looks to be the fool he has always been. John Conyers is in the hospital because of stress. A woman of privilege, a white woman of privilege, has told this poor black guy in the hospital to quit, to resign, to get out of there, that he is the problem. James Clyburn of the Congressional Black Caucasians is pointing out that all of Conyers' accusers are white women. Hollywood is damn near a smoking ember. The entirety of the drive-by media teetering on the brink of ruin, and it is Trump who is delusional. It is Trump who is losing his mind. No, these people are losing theirs. Cannot impress upon you how none of them ever dreamt wildly that anything like anything like this could ever happen ever no matter who was elected president no one could have predicted this wild year but i predicted the senate would would end up voting for the the uh, trump tax bill and i also you remember my saying many months ago, how once these young millennial women who were not around during the Clinton 90s, when they get a load of what the Clintons did and what Hillary did, when they fully understand what was happening in the Democrat Party with the mistreatment of women, the Hillary bimbo eruptions, you remember me predicting to you that they would not put up with it, and they would not cover for it, and they would not circle the wagons. And I dare to point out to you that many of the reporters on all of these sexual harassment stories are millennial women, and they're gunning for Matt Lauer, and they're gunning for Al Franken. They are not tolerant. They are not typical leftists circling the wagon because there's something more important to them, and that's been women's studies and feminist studies. And they are a generation simply not going to put up with what their parents and grandparents have handed down to them. And I'll tell you what, uh, John Conyers' lawyer just made a statement. He looks like he's from Nation of Islam, by the way. That's not a cut. I'm just advising you on his appearance if you haven't yet seen him. John Conyers' attorney said that Conyers will sure as hell not be pressured by a white woman of privilege to leave the House of Representatives. Well, he didn't say that. He said Pelosi. But we all know what they're thinking. John Conyers' attorney said, Conyers will sure as hell not be pressured by Nancy Pelosi into resigning. Here's Pelosi 23 soundbite. She had one other thing to say. In that There's pressure. a new day, and the uh, courage of the women coming forward is something that is... Uh, making a big difference, but also the attitude in the country, which I think some of it springs from the election of Donald Trump. No, no, no. This has nothing to do with Trump. This has to do with you people on the left deciding that morality became an individual choice about 40 years ago. You people own this, Miss Pelosi. And welcome back. You're tuned to the most listened to radio talk show in America, Rush Limbaugh and the Excellence in Broadcasting Network. You know, folks, we like... We like to be of service here. We like to help people who are in duress, uh, people who are suffering. And I said yesterday that I fully believe that in a year, uh, Matt Lauer will be back on TV. This is what the establishment does. Brian Williams is back. Uh, Dan Rather is roaming around out there somewhere on the, on the drive-by media plane, and he's uh, filing reports on obscure networks, but he's still out there, and he's still guesting on various cable shows as a reporter and news person of stature. 
The drive-bys have much to protect. They have to protect these individuals because that then protects their institution. And the institution here is the media itself, the drive-by media. So when any of them take big hits like this, they eventually will circle the wagons and Mount Wauer will resurface. I want to help speed that up. I was reading the Vanity Fair uh, piece, which is quite descriptive on some of the things that Matt Wauer was doing to these women. Did you know that he had a button underneath his desk that he could press and lock the door to his office? Now, why would one have them? I mean, he didn't have to get up. He didn't have to leave the desk in order to go up and lock the door. He had a button there. It could have been twofold. It could have been to keep women from leaving, but more than likely it was to keep people from walking in and interrupting what was happening in there. Now, the reason he didn't want to get up to have to go close and lock the door is because of what he would have had to interrupt taking place to do that. So if there is some kind of sexual activity going on while Matt Lauer is sitting in his chair, just reach under the desk and lock the door and you're done. So my idea, I know Matt Lauer wants to be back on TV, and I know that NBC wants him back on TV at some point. The drive-bys really do need that to happen. I'm just trying to offer a helpful suggestion. A reality TV show hosted by Matt Lauer, called Locked and Loaded. It would be half dating game and half survivor and would be filmed entirely in his office. Locked and Loaded with Matt Lauer. It'd be reality TV, got that door lock button underneath the desk. Think of the possibilities here, folks. By the way, the attorney... For John Conyers, we now have the audio. This was moments ago. He held a press conference defiantly suggesting that Conyers isn't going to quit. First of all, it is not up to Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi did not elect the congressman, and she sure as hell won't be the one to tell the congressman to leave. So the attorney for the ill African-American member of Congress told a white woman of privilege to cram it. She didn't elect him, and she's not going to have any say-so in whether or not he leaves Congress. And there are people saying that it really ought to be up to the voters. The voters put these people there. It ought to be up to the voters to determine what's hap- what happens to them. But that's only something suggestion- suggested when the people in trouble are Democrats. When it's Republicans that are caught in the crosshairs, we don't want to wait for the voters to decide. We're already going to blame the voters for sending this person there in the first place. And then the left comes forward with its deep devotion to ethics, morality, and says, for the good of the country and for the good of whatever else, the named Republican has to go. I want to address something here seriously. Nancy Pelosi predictably blamed all of this on... Trump. Uh, Grab soundbite 23. I want you to hear it again. Just 15 seconds. After suggesting that uh, that Conyers should resign, she realized she stepped in it. I mean, she realized that's a very, very controversial thing to do. So she had to try to soften it at the end of the presser. There's a new day, and the uh, courage of the women coming forward is something that is uh, making a big difference but also the attitude in the country, which I think some of it springs from the election of Donald Trump as president. So some of it springs from the election of Donald Trump. So the reason why our party is in so much trouble is the election of Donald Trump. Now, to a certain extent, that's true. Donald Trump has driven them crazy. But they were losing elections in great numbers before Trump came along. We've documented this, talked about it a lot. The Democrats have been in trouble for a long, long time. The thing that masked it was that Obama was in the White House and moving his agenda forward. But out there, all across the fruited plain, the Democrat Party has been imploding. And in their worldview, yeah, uh, the election of Trump does spell big trouble. But that's not what she means. 
She is trying to say here that all of these Democrat guys, the news, the talent, the news readers, the executives, the producers, the Hollywood, all of these people caught up in these sexual harassment charges and allegations is really because Trump was elected. And she's attempting to say Trump is this ignoramus and he's this barbarian and he's unsophisticated and of course that is influencing our culture and behavior and i want to seriously tackle this because that's not at all what's going on in america today back in 1987 when i was in sacramento i i wrote a newspaper called weekly newspaper column for a local paper and had writer's block one day and i literally could not think of anything to write about so as a means of trying to overcome it, I started writing down one-sentence thoughts, hoping that one of them or two would inspire me into a column idea. And after I got to about 15 of them, I said, you know what, this is the column, because I was writing sentences that were pithy, little philosophical things that I agreed with that I thought were correct. Such as undeniable truth, and they became the 35 undeniable truths of life. I kept going and writing enough of them to get the 750 words, which is your average column length, and then it became known as the 25 undeniable truths of life. For example, number 24 was feminism was established so as to allow unattractive women easier access to the mainstream of society. And it was true then, it's true now, it's one of the main drivers of militant feminism. Not the only, but it's a significant player. There was another one that I wrote. Morality is not defined by individual choice. That's all it was. Simple little statement, because even in 1987, I mean, we were coming out of the uh, the AIDS scare. Uh, well, we weren't coming out of it. We were smack dab in the middle of it. And it was all Reagan's fault, if you remember, because Reagan wasn't talking about it. The, uh, the militant political gay movement was all over this as Reagan's fault. And the, the order of the day, according to the American left back then, was the, that, that we conservatives did not have the right to impose our morality on anybody else. That we're a bunch of Puritans, and we're a bunch of stuffed shirts, and we're a bunch of boring dry balls, and we don't have the right to tell other people how to live. And it was all part of the aspect of liberalism that came to life based on the non-judgmentalism. Liberals do not want to be judged, and there's a very good reason why. The judgment of liberals would not be positive or uplifting. They don't want to be judged. They don't want to be held to convention. They don't want to be held to any standards, moral or otherwise. But I was making the point that morality is what it is. Morality is not defined by individual choice. You don't get to choose what's moral and not. What is moral and immoral is established and known. And it's kind of like pornography. You may have trouble defining it, but you know it when you see it. Same thing with morality and immorality. You may have trouble defining it for people, but you know immorality and, and ill-mannered behavior when you see it. And we raise our children to be moral and well-mannered. If we don't, there's no telling what individuals are going to turn out to be. Human beings need to be taught need to be raised, need to be instructed. There's the reason you have a, a, a kid at the dinner table that interrupts people constantly or throws food. You stop them and you tell them that's wrong. If they refuse to get the message, you punish them. If they engage in behavior that is harmful to others or themselves, you stop them and tell them and you raise them. You try to raise them with good manners and self-respect, respect for others, and at some point, all of this evolves into you teaching them morality, right and wrong. Well, for the last 50 years, if not longer, there's been an attack on that whole premise of right and wrong, and who gets to define it? And the left has lived and died with the premise that nobody but they or them get to define it, and it's an individual choice. Until you walk in the shoes of a liberal, you have no right to judge. You have no right to say what's right and wrong. And so, 
The offshoot of this is that whatever liberals wanted to do was moral because they wanted to do it. And anybody that came along and judged them and disapproved was attacked. They were under attack. Many, many people who did this seriously were, were tried to be destroyed. And it begot the culture war. The culture war is largely over morality, the concepts of right and wrong, and whether or not they're universal or the result of individual choice. And the left has always believed that morality is an individual choice, that you don't get to define it for anybody else, and neither does society. And that attitude is what I believe has led us to today. There are consequences for all actions and inactions, and uh, bad behavior, immoral behavior, incorrect behavior is always going to carry a price at some point. There will always be consequences for it. How do you explain all of these wealthy men, Matt Wauer reputedly making $25 million a year, Harvey Weinstein, Multi, multi million. All of these people involved have incredible wealth. They also had positions of power where there was nobody could tell them what they could do and couldn't do. And when they did behave badly, there was no punishment. Everybody got out of the way. Everybody was afraid of them. What lessons were they taught? I suggest to you none. They clearly didn't have any conscience. Or if they did, they were able to override it and subordinate it to their personal desires. But this is why we're where we are. And, of course, the people who advocate for morality and attempt to instill and live by concepts of right and wrong are mocked and laughed at and made fun of, and they're considered to be very dull and boring, and they're usually religious, and that means we can really attack them. And they just do that because they're so boring. Nobody would want to have sex with them anyway, and nobody would want to hang around with them anyway. And nobody would want to have fun with them anyway. And so they're so dull and boring that they give themselves self-respect by telling themselves they're good people. And the liberals just roll right over them with this idea that they are the oddballs, that they're the kooks, that they pose the threat because they are attempting to impose their morality on everybody much like the left accuses the United States of trying to impose freedom on the rest of the world. Freedom is not an imposition. Morality could be, depending on your proclivities. But I really think this is the root of it here, folks, and it's taken a little while here, but the people who are being discovered to have engaged in this behavior, which is clearly reprehensible and perverted, and whatever descriptive you want to come up with, no doubt are of the belief that morality doesn't apply to them and that it's nobody's business anyway. And I want to add a couple things to this, but I've got a break here because of the programming format. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Meeting and surpassing all audience expectations every day. It's Rush Limbaugh. The liberals have turned on McCain on Twitter. After he agrees to vote for the tax bill, they are all over McCain. They're having a fit as of around 11 o'clock this morning when he announced that he was uh, going to vote yes on tax cuts. They are just fit to be tied. Now, I know I'm citing Twitter when I've often said that I wish the drive-bys would stop. But in this case, it fits my purpose. Here's McCain. I don't think he cares in this instance, but it's just another great illustration. They don't really love McCain. They don't love Republicans. It's not about that at all. So McCain's now getting beat up to shreds. And I don't know what impact it's going to have on him. We'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, I want to start on the phones with Catherine in Baltimore. Great to have you on the EIB Network. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Rush. How are you? Fine, thank you. Great to hear from you. Yes, um, just a couple points. Uh, the first point, 
Um, is, isn't it interesting with all the harassment and assault, and char- assault charges coming, you know, various politicians, media people, that the private sector fires, gets rid of almost immediately those that are accused, Matt Lauer, Weinstein, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in government with John Conyers, Barney Frank, we have to have process. Um, we have spokespeople. Right. Um, we have to look at the legacy of the person. You know, the, the wheels of justice seem to take forever. Um, it, you know, and again, it's a little dose of the government versus the private sector. Now, this is a brilliant, um, it's a brilliant observation. And I, yeah. I, I in fact, uh, can, can you, I would like to offer you an iPhone 10 if you would like one. <laughs> But well, I want I you. I want you to hang on because I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna waste time asking you to. You're carrying this. If just don't hang up and snurdy will get the get the details. If you want one, you have I, to, do, you, I do. But okay. I have a second point that. that well, you I better be fast. Turn. What is it? What is it? What is it? Okay. okay, the fact that you know you have to. I implore people, as you spoke of morality, to judge people by the content of their character as an individual, not this group politics. All. Single mothers are wonderful. All people in the Black National Caucus are, are wonderful. All immigrants. That's are a congressional wonderful. Black Caucasians, right? Yeah. That, I, no, I'm going to take issue with one thing. You, your, your observation is brilliant, but the private sector ain't that fast. We'll be back in just a second. Don't go away. Cal Thomas has a piece today. The value of high moral standards has never been more apparent. Who decided traditional virtues were no longer viable? Somebody do a study, find out people were being damaged by being taught too much virtue. When did this happen, he asks. Hang on, folks, we're coming back. Greetings, my good friends. Welcome back. You are tuned to the one and only EIB Network, and I am Rush Limbaugh, America's real anchorman, America's truth detector, and the doctor of democracy. And here we are, ready to go, revved and ready, to emit vocal vibrations, rhetoric and resonance from coast to coast. 800-282-2882, if you want to be on the program, the email address, lrushbow at eibnet.us. Our, uh, our previous caller was Catherine from Baltimore, and she her point was was a good one. She's contrasting the difference between the private sector and the public sector when it terms uh, comes to uh, victims and perpetrators of sexual harassment, how they're dealt with. She observed that private sector, once they find out about it, they get rid of the perp right then and there. Government, no. They take their time. They circle the wagons. They do everything they can to save the perp. They come out and say it's none of our business. They come out and say it's only sex. Uh, didn't get in the way of whoever we're talking about, job performance and so forth. And while overall that's true, if you just strict comparison, but I'm going to tell you, folks, the private sector is not that fair. They're not instantaneous. Now, everybody thinks that NBC decided to get rid of Matt Wauer in about five minutes, but I contend to you that they didn't. I contend to you that they hoped not to have to get rid of Matt Wauer. And I do it on the basis of this. You remember the original Ronan Farrow story on Harvey Weinstein that ran in the New Yorker? Some of you may remember that Ronan Farrow works at NBC. He's a consultant, a stringer, he's... uh, doesn't have a regular gig, but he does contract pieces. They assign him to go do stories, probably to get him out of the building. And then he goes and does the stories. He comes back, and he came back, and he had he had the Weinstein story. He had it nailed. He had thousands and thousands of words, and he had interviews. And NBC shelved it. NBC said, not interested. NBC said, we don't think you've nailed this down. NBC said, we're not comfortable with this. NBC said, shop it somewhere else. We just don't think this is ready for publication or for air. So Ronan Farrell walked it down the street to the New Yorker where they immediately ran it. 
and the rest is history. Now, why would NBC have passed on this? Now, our old buddy Seton Motley believes that this is evidence that these news organizations do not do investigative news, particularly when it's of and about themselves. They do everything they can to delay it or to hide it or maybe even cover it up. How long did CBS know about Charlie Rose and PBS before they... Time came where they had no choice but then to get rid of Charlie. Is my contention these people, these places, knew of this for quite a while? And the, to me, the best evidence of it, look at Matt Wauer. Everybody's saying they're shocked. We didn't know. At least that's what's published, published quotes. But then we learn after the first 24 hours that some people say, oh, yeah, we knew. Oh, there were rumors. Oh. And then within 24 hours, we have every detail we could possibly want about Matt Wauer's secret button under his desk to lock the door. And these people have no problem finding Matt Lauer sound bites from way back in 2005 and 2006 where he tells Meredith Vieira, hey, bend over a little more. Nobody had any trouble finding the Katie Couric soundbite where she said that the biggest, most noteworthy thing about working with Matt Lauer was that he liked to pinch her butt. So I think they've known. I think there's been suspicion uh, Jeff Zucker, who ran NBC for a while and was the exec producer of the Today Show, now over at CNN. I don't know this guy. I just, I, I've, I've never saw this kind of predation. I, 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 a different guy I, 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 I didn't know. Well, there's got to be a reason that they didn't run the Ronan Farrow story. And there's also word that Matt Lauer had significant editorial control over what stories did make the air at the Today Show and what stories didn't. So, now granted, though, she, her point is right. I mean, the private sector is is much quicker to move once they decide they're going to move. And I don't dispute that. But my my caution here is that the you know, government, granted, they... they they do everything they can to avoid having to make a move. They don't, particularly Democrats. Now, the Republicans, the Republicans are the fastest to get rid of their own. The Democrats, not so much. Democrats circle the wagons, give it every chance they can to survive. And, of course, can you blame them? Their big formative event is the Clinton years. They got away. They literally got away, by the way, with the assistance of Matt Lauer in suggesting that it was a vast right-wing conspiracy that sent Monica Lewinsky into the Oval Office to deliver pizza to Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton shows up on the day show, Matt Lauer interviewing her, and she talks about this vast right-wing conspiracy, and Matt Lauer doesn't say, come on, don't insult our intelligence. You really think there's a bunch of right-wingers that made this happen? Instead, he just nodded his head. And so from the Democrat perspective, they get away with it. The Democrat lesson is they're not held accountable. The Democrat lesson is that there's nobody can make them get rid of their stars. The Democrat lesson is using the big dog Bill Clinton, they get away with it. And before him, Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy abandoned a woman at Chappaquiddick who died in the back seat of his car that he ran into a uh, lake off a bridge. Ted Kennedy and Chris Dodd, famous for the waitress sandwich maneuver at the La Brasserie restaurant private room. The legions of Democrats, Hugh Hefner, I mean, the legion of Democrats that get away with this and not just get away with it, they become bigger stars in the party. This is why, you know, I made an observation. I've been, when, when this latest round of this stuff began, and even during the Clinton campaign, during the, uh, during the primary, some of you may remember many months ago, I predicted that the excrement would hit the fan once millennial women 
learned the truth about Bill and Hillary Clinton's treatment of women. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton were relying on the fact that even in the 2016 presidential campaign, that it was the same media. Remember, the Clintons never did find a way to get out of the 90s. Their strategy, their assumptions of their enemies, it was all rooted in the history of the 90s, and they never moved forward. They stayed locked into the 90s and continued to treat events in 2014, 15, 16, as though they were happening all over again from the 1990s, and the strategies of dealing with them didn't change. But back in the 1990s, it was perfectly fine for Hillary Clinton to destroy women alleging her husband had abused them or raped them. Perfectly fine. Democrat Party said, great. Democrat Party applauded it. Women in the media applauded it. Female reporters said... I would give Bill Clinton a Lewinsky as perpetual thanks for keeping abortion legal. The female press corps in the 1990s did not lift a finger to hold Bill Clinton accountable or Hillary Clinton accountable. And they, not only that, they helped the Clintons destroy or damage or try to damage any opposition to the Clintons from the right or from the women who were Clinton's victims. Well, I predicted, based on my study of millennials and what they were being taught with the never-ending women's studies, and I'm looking at this rape culture on college and how it's being promoted and how Lena Dunham and all these millennial women are telling every other woman that rape is awaiting them right around the corner, Rolling Stone with a totally fake story. And I surmised, using intelligence guided by experience, that once... A significant number of these millennial women reporters actually learn what happened. When they actually learn how Hillary Clinton ran a bimbo eruptions operation to destroy women alleging sexual harassment, that they would not behave the way the female reporters of the 90s did, that they wouldn't put up with it, and that they would begin to see the Clintons in a whole new light. Because they hadn't lived through it. The Clintons were not something they had a personal connection to. There was no investment in the Clintons. Their futures and their lives and their businesses didn't depend on keeping the Clintons happy or keeping the Clintons at the top of the heap of the Democrat Party. And if you look, many of the info babes and reporterettes that are writing stories on Franken and Matt Lauer and Harvey Weinstein at all are millennial female reporters. They have been marinating all of these years in women's studies courses in the academy, and they're not going to put up with this kind of stuff. They're not going to put up with the groping, and they're not going to ignore it, and they're not going to think it doesn't mean anything, and they're not going to say, we got to protect the gropers for the Democrat Party. The generation of women before them overlooked all of that. The female generation before the millennials actually enabled the sexual harassers and the gropers and the pervs but not millennial women, except against Republicans, of course. That's not changed. Can you imagine how Bill and Hillary must have laughed themselves silly over Bob Peckwood being forced to resign while Bill was getting away with the things he was doing to women at that very period in time? Speaking of how the Clintons got away with things, I just reminded you how Matt Lauer helped the Clintons facilitate that absolutely insulting idea that it was a vast right-wing conspiracy that somehow finagled Monica Lewinsky into the Oval Office delivering pizza. And it was somehow vast right-wing conspiracy that ended up being responsible for Clinton's semen on a dress that she was wearing. Matt Lauer helping to facilitate that very idea. So I think my prediction, to a certain extent, has come true.
The millennial women reporters reporting on this have no tolerance. They're not willing to look the other way when it comes to these Democrat uh, pervs. I don't deny there's a there's a there's a preference for these guys politically. Don't miss, I'm, I'm not saying that these women are conservative or or supportive of Republicans or conservative, but they're not. They they have been literally marinated in women's studies. They have grown up being taught that life is as a woman is to be abused, harassed, and at worst raped. And so when there are examples of it, they're not going to give these perps a pass. And I think it's confusing the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party has always been able to rely on the media, you know. The Democrat Party, that's always been the fallback. The Democrat Party's escape hatch. The Democrat Party's pink slip. The Democrat Party's permission slip. The Democrat Party, note from the doctor, note for the parents, has always been the drive-by media. The drive-by media has covered for all of them. And elements of the drive-by media are trying to cover for them now, trying to cover for Franken, trying to cover for Conyers. They didn't have enough time to try to cover for Matt Lauer. But don't be surprised at some of the things you might hear in the future about how, you know what, we might have overreacted in the early days of Matt Lauer, and maybe some of these things we need to reconsider, because they're going to have to try to rehab these people. I don't mean millennial female reporters. I'm talking about the Democrat Party and the... America left at large is going to have to find a way to rehab these guys because if they don't, the taint is permanent. Then they may not succeed at rehabbing them, but they can't allow this taint to go unbattled. Why are you frowning? You just I don't. I, well, well, I don't know how the millennial. It, it depends. Snurdly said, how do you think millennial women are going to react to the rehab? Depends on how they play the rehab. If the perp comes out of rehab or whatever and is just falling all over himself in tears and sorry and and so forth, you never know how it'll play. Look, as human beings, we want to forgive anyway. We are a people that are very much into second chances. I'm just, I'm just saying beyond all that, I mean, I think this is our basic human nature. Beyond all that, the politics of this, they've got to try to rehab and save these guys. I don't know how far they'll go to try to save Al Franken, for example. That day of reckoning is yet to happen, but it's going to happen. Franken's, he's gone. They just, nobody involved knows it yet. Another prediction made by me here on the 30th of November at 122 Eastern Time in the afternoon. Welcome back, my friends. Half my brain tied behind my back. Always, just to be fair. And we go next to Rochester, New York. This is Steve. It's great to have you, sir. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. This is the best birthday present ever. Well, we happy talk- birthday. Is your birthday today? Yes. How old are you? I am 64. 64 years old. Congratulations. Which is how I know what I know. I used to listen to you before uh, old Mick from the High Mountains used to call in with his favorite stew recipe. (laughs) Mick from the High Mountains of New Mexico. Yeah, he was great. He was. Sadly, no longer with us. No. Anyway, in the first hour, you said that you never asked us to call in. But we had. You asked us to call in sometime in the 90s, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what it was. But you want to show Congress what would happen if we did, because they had kept saying that Rush uh, is telling his people to call in, and that's why we're getting so many calls. You have an excellent memory. He is exactly right. I, forget, I, I think it was on a budget deal or something going on, and, and and I made it a point when this program started not to use activism. I was not the guy telling you to cut up your credit card and send them to Mobile or Exxon. I, I, I did not urge people to call Washington. I didn't want it to be seen as, as, as artificial. And yet the media kept explaining 
overrun phone calls in Capitol Hill because I was telling my audience to call. So one day, for a journalist, it might have been Howard Feynman Newsweek. I've, it was Steve Roberts. Steve Roberts, who is the husband of Koki Roberts at ABC News. That's exactly right. Steve Roberts, I said, let me show you what will happen when I do. And I did. He's right. One day, I urged everybody to call Congress about something there and shut down the Capitol Hill switchboard. You are exactly right. And to this day, I get requests from individual members of the House and Senate to do it, and I don't do it. <laughs> I don't do it. Because it's, it's once, once a bunch of phone calls can be uh, said to be artificially generated by a talk show host, then they're discounted. And that I don't want. Look, it's your birthday here. I want to give you the opposite, op- opportunity of some gifts. Would you like a new iPhone? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, great. Sure. <laughs> I have a bunch of them. I have an iPhone 8 Plus or an iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 is the hot shot. That's the newest. That's state of the art. I assume that's what you want. Oh, fa- yeah, fabulous. Thank you. All right. Now, I'm also going to give you a one-year complimentary subscription to the Limbaugh Letter and the Rush 24-7 website. So, Whoa. that's right. Happy birthday. Hang on just a second here. Do not hang up, because Mr. Snurdly needs to get some questions answered to you about your carrier and your address to send this stuff to you. In the meantime, we'll take a brief time out. Be right back after this. Don't go away. So here we are on the 30th of November. Now, here on this program, the Christmas season began with Thanksgiving. It always does. But tomorrow, if there's any doubt, December 1st, it's really official. And every year, folks, the um, EIB Network and, and the Rush website have had an ornament for your Christmas tree as what we call a premium. If you order a new subscription to... Uh, the website or the newsletter, the ornament would be thrown in uh, as the premium gift. And it was also available in the EIB store. We've changed it around this year. We've had for the past couple of months a brand new Tervis Tumblr as the premium for new subscribers to the website, which is encyclopedic. I mean, I, I could spend 10 minutes extolling the virtues of RushLimbaugh.com. Uh, it's got a free side, too, that is entirely it just it, it's got so much information on it you couldn't possibly access it all but the the uh, the, the paid side is got even more we're just so proud of it i can't i can't begin to tell you i don't really extol its virtues enough here uh and then of course there's the limbaugh letter we're we're changing things up this year rather than the christmas ornament become a premium we this year are installing it as a sale item in the EIB store, and new subscribers from now till the end of the year will continue to get the brand new Tervis Tumblr. I'm holding the Tervis Tumblr up right now here on the uh, on the Ditto Cam. Let me put on the side camera, maybe a little closer. There you go. That's an idea of the Tervis Tumblr. It's uh, excellent at keeping cold beverages cold with no sweat on the outside. I even drink my coffee out of it because it keeps. Warm beverages warm much longer than a standard glass or cup. But I want to tell you about the ornament because we've gone all in on the Christmas tree ornament this year in honor of almost 30 incredible years on the radio. We commissioned a wonderful American company in a small town in Pennsylvania to hand make our special, these are hand-forged, special edition Rush Limbaugh EIB Christmas ornaments. And they're one of a kind. These exclusive ornaments, folk, they're stunning. Particularly compared to the ornaments that we have distributed in previous years. I have one here. I can hold it up on the ditto cam, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a picture of it, and we'll put it on the switcher. Uh I wouldn't be able to get close enough to show it to you, and a close-up shot will give you more detail of it. But you'll also be able to see it at RushLimbaugh.com. It is a work of art. There's an American flag proudly placed in the center of the circle with uh, America's anchorman, the EIB logo, and my name etched around the flag beautifully. And there is a special quote from me hand-stamped on the back and the year. 
Now, we got to see these ornaments being hand-forged. We actually sent our our uh, design crew to the factory in Pennsylvania where these are made to watch them being hand-forged. It was incredible. You would not believe how many steps are involved making these ornaments just looking at it. But they are quality works of art. And the people that we commissioned to make them are the best in their craft. They're right here in America, in Pennsylvania. Starts in the art department with our design, goes to the master engraver. It gets cut. It gets hand hammered. It's then polished. Every single ornament hand tied with a ribbon for you to hang on your tree. All handmade by Americans. There is no question this year's EIB Rush Limbaugh ornament is one of a kind, a collector's piece. We have a limited supply, so be sure to act quickly if you would like one. Don't say I didn't warn you if we end up being sold out here. Well, we're not going to try to Apple iPhone you on this. We got a, we've got a significant stock, but, I mean, don't wait too long here. The ornaments are handmade. We can't just mass produce these things with a phone call. So go to RushLimbaugh.com and scope them out. Take a look at them. You'll find them at the EIB store. There's a tab there you'll find uh, at RushLimbaugh.com. That's where you'll see them. Here's uh, here's Rick, Fort Myers, Florida. Great to have you with us on the phone today, sir. How are you doing? Hey, hey, Rush. Uh, you know the phone thing. You know, I, I'm I'm sure that your phone's better than the Obama phone. But anyway, um, you know, <laughs> no, this, there's uh, no comparison. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Um, anyway, uh, I, I would put yours on the wall under a frame, you know, up, uh, you know, up in the living room. But anyway, uh, isn't sexual harassment a type of intimidation? So if sexual harassment—that's exactly yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So if there, if sexual harassment is a type of intimidation, that means that the left has been holding the women down, breaking through the glass ceiling. Wouldn't you say? No question about it. Yeah, and, no, and uh, but see, more... wait a minute, hold it a minute. That kind of works in the opposite way, though, as far as the women are, because the women think they have to shut up if they're going to have a chance at, at advancement. Yeah, yeah. And one more thing, you know, Chuck Todd, F. Chuck Todd, you call him, uh, a few months ago said that Hillary had the thumb on the scales when she was running for office against Bernie. So they already, had, they already knew, I mean, the press already knew that they were in for Hillary. And so the thing is, I think we need to scrutinize them. When did they know? When did they know it? You know, about all these things. You know, I mean, they need to be held accountable for this stuff. Well, the Democrats are not interested in holding them accountable. And that's it's their deal. The Democrats didn't even want the FBI to examine their server. The whole point of all this has been to cover up the rigging of that primary. And in, in politics, the Democrat Party can do what they want to do, and, and it's, it's uh, so-called, so-called nobody else's business. Where it becomes other people's business is you, you inform the American people and Democrat voters that their primary was rigged, and then they suppose they're supposed to take care of it uh, with their votes and their donations the, the next time around. Uh, when do they know and when do they know it? Uh, I mean... It's been widely known what Hillary Clinton was doing with Debbie Blabbermouth Schultz in terms of uh, of rigging that primary. Anyway, I appreciate the call. Uh, TJ in Athens, Georgia, you're next. Great to have you, sir. How are you doing? Hey, it's a pleasure to talk with you, Russ, and I'm gonna, I am gonna. want to wish you and your staff a very Merry Christmas. Thank you, TJ. I appreciate that. Uh, Mike, what, you said something the other day about Elizabeth Warren and the CF, CPFB. That's right. The Consumer organization and uh looking back i am so sick of the clintons i've been i just can't say it but uh since she did the i stand by your man interview on uh, cbs years ago it's just how did they get away with this and i think what and i was connecting the dots given your comment about warren and she was showing up on the campaign trail last year with clinton so many times and i think if they're laundering money to the liberal causes they expected her that they really expected her to win and that was the that was really what what was really bothering me is that i think what was the connection or the dot connection was she's going to 
win automatically, and they'll have, they'll just funnel all that money through that CFPB. And I just want to run that thought by you. Well, they've already been doing that. That was the whole reason the thing was set up. What we're talking about here is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It was an offshoot of Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was a piece of legislation that came out of the financial crisis 2008, designed, as they said, to protect consumers from, once again, predatory lenders and banks. And and the banks had only become predatory lenders because the government demanded that they loan money to people who couldn't pay it back. That's the subprime mortgage crisis. As an adjunct to Dodd-Frank, Elizabeth Warren, Pocahontas, set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But there's a twist. It was set up as an autonomous agency, and it was signed into law by Obama, which is how it passed the unconstitutionality of it. It was signed into law by Obama. It is not funded by appropriation from Congress which is what makes it unconstitutional. It is funded from the Federal Reserve. In addition, it has its own leader, its own president or head, I forget what the title, uh, executive director, whatever. In this case, the most recent one was Richard Cordray. And what this actually was, was a... It was, it had a twofold real purpose. The, the stated public purpose was that this agency was going to safeguard the little guy. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was going to make sure that predatory lenders didn't screw you, didn't take advantage of you, didn't overcharge you interest rates, didn't deny you loans, didn't all of this stuff. It was typical caca from the Democrat Party. What it really was, was a pass-through, it was a way to get money to left-wing special interest causes. The way it did it was via fines. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau had the authority to fine lending institutions, financial institutions, for improper behavior. And so let's make something up. Let's say they want to find Wells Fargo because Wells Fargo did something that they disapprove of. And they find Wells Fargo a million dollars. Wells Fargo will pay it rather than fight it. It's part of the cost of doing business. That million dollars. Remember, the CFPB is not, not, not accountable to Congress. It's not funded with taxpayer money. It's funded from the Federal Reserve. So it's therefore independent. They took that million dollars, for example, and would give it out to Planned Parenthood or would give half of it to a global warming special interest, or a climate change special interest, or what have you. A union. And this happened with all the fines that were levied. It was the purpose. It was the unstated purpose. It was a funding mechanism for left-wing special interest causes. In addition to that, it served as a money-laundering pass-through because some of these fines, as they were collected and run through the CPFB, uh, then ended up in places other than left-wing special interest causes, and the money had to be cleaned, and it had to be appear, had to be, appear to be legitimate when it was redirected. So the controversy now is Cordray, current executive director, is leaving. And according to Pocahontas, the president doesn't have any authority in naming his successor. He does. Richard Cordray, a nobody, a chump change employee, does not have, because of something called the Federal Succession Act, he does not have the constitutional authority to name his successor. Only the president does. Because even though this thing was set up as an independent agency, it's still in the executive branch. And so the fight now is Cordray wanted to name his deputy, Leandra English. And the reason is they want to make sure this thing operates as it has been, even though Trump is president. They want to be able to find lending institutions and take that money and give them to left-wing special interest causes, or even individuals. 
Well, when Cordray announced he's leaving, Trump moves in and says, sorry, I'm putting Mick Mulvaney over there. You don't have the right to name your successor. I'm putting Mick Mulvaney, the Office of Manager Budget, in there. And he's in there, and it went to court. The libs tried to take this to court, and a judge told Cordray, you don't have the right to name your successor. You don't have the constitutional right. You have no authority whatsoever. You're a chump change employee. The libs and Pocahontas set this thing up what they thought would be acting in perpetuity, unaccountable to anybody. And the idea was that even if a Republican was elected president, he wouldn't be able to touch it. Well, Trump said, really? You don't think I can touch it? Watch this. And Mick Mulvaney is now in charge. And the reason they are bleeding like stuck pigs is because Mulvaney is going to find out exactly everything that's been going on there and is going to expose it. And this thing that was set up ostensibly to protect consumers and the little guy from these horrible, mean financial corporations, the American people are going to learn that the Democrat Party was using this as an adjunct personal piggy bank, a way to get private sector money funneled to left-wing special interest causes. That was not taxpayer money. came from the Federal Reserve, but it's the fine money. This was, This is... A classic example of the left's real intent for wanting control of government. It has nothing to do with protecting consumers. It has nothing to do with making sure the little guy is protected. It's all about the left being able to reach out and put their hands on somebody else's money with the power to fine them. And then take that money and essentially give it to themselves. Give it to their own operatives advancing their agenda. I have to take a break. Ponder that. Back in a second. Talent on loan from God. What is this CNN reporting that Manafort and Mueller have reached agreement? I mean, they've, uh, Manafort has flipped. Is that what they're trying to say? Uh, CNN only, they have, well, 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 we'll hold off on any details since we don't have them. And we'll wait until we get details and we'll pass them on. Do you have that in the switcher yet? Here is, I just snapped a picture of the ornament in its box. And I've put it in the switcher here at the, uh, at the Ditto Cam. So there it is, folks. Um, that ornament, that's probably three and a half inches in diameter is what you're looking at there. That is hand forged hand-stamped, and the year and uh, pithy saying is on the back of this thing. But that's actually taken in the box that it comes in. You can't see the ribbon at the top, but there's a red ribbon attached to it at the top that you uh, use to hang on the tree. And you'll also be able to see it at RushLimbaugh.com. But it's a special endeavor uh, this year. And it's it's not a premium with new subscriptions to the website or the newsletter. It is for sale individually at the EIB store at uh, at RushLimbaugh.com. Now, I realize this is frustrating for those of you not watching the program on the Ditto Cam. The Ditto Cam is part of the uh, subscription or member side at RushLimbaugh.com. You can watch the program on an app on your phone or your iPad, or you can watch it later. You can watch hosts of programs from the past later or listen to the audio streaming there are podcasts of each program each day made available about 30 minutes after the program, and they are all without commercials um, if you watch them on a on a delayed basis. So, And that's just one of the many benefits of membership at RushLimbo.com. Now I get to get a quick timeout. You sit tight. One big broadcast hour remains, and we're getting right to it. All right, the Manafort Mueller deal is just about his bail. It's not about anything else. Uh, Manafort uh, it still has to be approved by the by the uh, by the judge. Uh, got the details in front of me, but not enough time to share them with you here. But all it is is a is an agreement on his uh, bail. What he forfeits if he splits town, and you know what. He's promising to give up in this order. The judge hasn't even approved it yet, so we'll take a break and be back in a sec. All right, here we are back at it, my friends. Uh, truly having more fun than a human being should be allowed to have today. At Rush Limbaugh and the EIB Network, 
And, of course, the distinguished and prestigious Limbaugh Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. Yes, sir, Bob. Okay, so, uh, yeah, 800-282-2882. If you want to be on the program, the email address, lrushbo, eibnet.us. As usual, uh, we get to the third hour, and there's a lot of stuff I still want to cram in here, so we're going to give it our best shot. Go back to Savannah Guthrie. Not going to play the sound bite. Uh, grab number five, but Savannah Guffer says, you know, I, I, we, we just don't know more than what I just shared with you. But we will be covering the story as reporters and journalists, because journalists are wonderful people, and we're journalists, and, and we're really important, and so we're going to be covering what happened to our friend here, and, and it's really bad what happened to Matt. I feel so bad and heartbroken for Matt, what happened to Matt. And he's my dear friend and my, my friend and partner. He's beloved by many, many people here. This is a sad thing what happened to it. What do you mean what happened to it? And I'm heartbroken for the brave colleague who came forward to tell her story and other women who may have their own stories. That means there's going to be more. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Snurdly, that that means? And we are grappling with a dilemma that so many people have faced these weeks. How do you reconcile your love for someone with the revelation that they behave? Let me tell you what, Savannah, let me tell you what everybody knows. We all know how the drill works here. Matt Wauer is going to be back in the drive-by media inside of a year. And so is Charlie Rose. If Charlie isn't, it's going to be an age thing. But Matt Wauer is going to be back. Just like Brian Williams was back after six months sabbatical at home. I'm waiting for Brian Williams to say that Matt Lauer harassed him. You know, Charlie, Matt, uh, uh, Brian likes to be in every news story. But we all know the drill here. This isn't permanent. These people circle the wagons. You know, Dan Rather is still out there putzing around doing news stories. There's always going to be somebody somewhere in the drive-by media who will look past all this. And Mount Lauer will be hired somewhere. I don't know that Bill O'Reilly will, but Mount Lauer will. Safe to say. So, yeah, I feel so bad, I feel so bad, but don't, because it's, you know, you just have to go through the role here. you gotta, you got to play the game. Okay, so you're trying to get Trump on this stuff, <laughs> and the wrong people keep showing up. you got to dump them. It's the price that we pay to get Trump. In fact, we have a caller coming up with an interesting perspective on all of this. Mr. Snurdly, does the caller think this is a conspiracy? Not a, well, uh, the caller thinks that all these people are dropping like flies and that all of us are reacting, yeah, damn right, this is a principle, you should go. We have no tolerance, out of there. And then when they finally get Trump, for us to be consistent, we're going to say, well, yeah, that's horrible, Trump, you got to go. So even now, with the drive-bys reeling, there are people on our side who think they are infallible. And how about Megyn Kelly to replace Matt Wauer? That was my first thought this morning when I first heard this. There's no faster way to rehab her. What? If, uh, who? 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 Maybe, uh, don't forget that. I'm thinking of NBC management. They've got the Today Show here they got to worry about here. This is their, this is where number one Mayo anchor that's, that, that, that's down for the count here. They've got their, that they hired Megyn Kelly to be their up and coming star, the new whatever face, and it's not worked so far. But what if in the midst of all of this attention, they plop her in there next to Savannah Guthrie? Do not rule it out. Do not. It's exactly the kind of play that Andy Lack and these guys that run that place would be thinking about. They'd be thinking about it from the standpoint of rehabbing her image, give her the top slot there, well, next to Savannah. Uh, it would be a statement that NBC is making that she is earned it, qualified for it. They're willing to invest in it. And if it made Savannah and Hoda quit, well, who knows? If there's a cat fight over this, even better.
No, I don't want to bring back Brian Gumble. Brian, Brian Gumble's happy over there at uh, Real Sports at HBO. No, no, HBO is its own enclave, you know, of, of <sighs> wacko leftists. I mean, that place is gone in terms of their produced news type programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can see them putting Megyn Kelly in there. Not predicting it, but I'm just telling you if they did it, I would not be surprised. Uh, I don't know if she'd do a show with all the accusers for Lauer. Depends on how many of them show up. Depends on how much NBC thinks they could gain by doing that. Versus how much they might lose by uh, by doing that. Anyway, here's Brian Stelter. Now, now uh, Guthrie said she didn't know anything about this. She didn't know she was heartbroken for her brave colleague. But Brian Stelter on CNN this morning had this to say. When I watched that broadcast, I was thinking to myself, this is an awkward situation for Lauer and his co-host Savannah Guthrie, because both of them knew that these stories were in the works. Uh, their colleagues have been getting phone calls from reporters who have been investigating Lauer's history. So NBC was in a very delicate situation here. They say they had never received any formal complaints about Lauer, but they knew reporters were digging, looking into his past. So they kept him on the air until Tuesday morning. See, this is further evidence that they knew. And what Brian Stelter is saying here is that all these NBC people were getting called by reporters. Hey, we hear that Matt Wauer X, Matt Wauer Y, Matt Wauer Z. I don't know. I don't know. So they knew. You know what I wonder? And I'm watching all these cable networks. Like on CNN today, every female anchorette has done the Matt Wauer story. And I wonder what's really going through their minds as they do the story. They're reading the prompters and they're putting on the appropriate facial expression as dictated by the prompter and the director. But I wonder what they're really thinking. Are they crestfallen? Are they heartbroken that one of the icons of the liberal media is gone? Or are they secretly happy that it's an opening that now may free them up or others for upward mobility job-wise? If you're at CNN, would you rather be working at NBC News or CNN? Are you happy to see a competitor fall? Or are you worried that the leftist drive-by media is taking a big hit and you'd really rather not have to report on this? I wonder what really goes through their mind and particularly the women, because the women have to stand together in solidarity against this kind of male predatory behavior. And before they knew, Matt Lauer, I mean, he was probably big shot, great guy, widely admired and looked up to. And so many bubbles are bursting here. And so many images are being shot to smithereens. You just wonder what they think. Because you know when they're doing a story on a, like an O'Reilly or any other Republican or conservative, they're just in their mind. They love it. They love reporting on it. They love the raised eyebrows. They love doing it. But when it's one of their own, what is really going through their mind, we'll never know. Because we never know. But I would still like to. So little Brian says they all knew, and it's true. The New York Times is working on a story, and apparently, folks, the worst is out there and is known and is only a matter of time before it drops. But no detail on what the worst is. Let's go through some uh, flashbacks here with Matt Lauer. Here he is back on October 14, 2016, interviewing the vice presidential nominee, Mike Pence, about the Access Hollywood tape of then-host Billy Bush and a real estate mogul, as he was called then, Donald Trump. One week ago today, we heard Donald Trump, in his own words, brag about making unwanted sexual advances on women. And now we have six women who've come forward saying, in fact, that was more than bragging. He did those things to them. You've heard what they've had to say. You, you've you read it. Do you believe these women? Okay, we don't have the Pence answer. That's the, we're just going flashbacks because we're asking what's going through Matt Lauer's head as he's asking the question. No, seriously. What 
if, if, if you're in this situation, if you have done what you are asking somebody about in an accusatory way, what goes through your mind? Here is Matt Wauer, and uh, let's see, this is, uh, well, it's with nobody. This is the announcement that uh, uh, Billy Bush was not good enough person to appear on the Today Show. Because Billy Bush hosted Trump on that Access Hollywood video. Billy Bush was supposed to then come to the Today Show, but they put the kibosh on that. NBC News announced last night that Billy Bush would be leaving the Today Show effective immediately, noting that he was a valued colleague and longtime member of the broader NBC family. A statement Billy released separately last night read in part, I look forward to what lies ahead. And of course, all of us here today wish Billy the very best. And we hope he keeps quiet about what he knows about us. Hey, what a... <laughs> really? You got a report in this stuff knowing full well? Here is Matt Wauer uh, grilling Bill O'Reilly. You were probably the last guy in the world that they wanted to fire because you were the guy that the ratings and the revenues were built on. You carried that network on your shoulders for a lot of years. So doesn't it seem safe to assume that the people at Fox News were given a piece of information or given some evidence that simply made it impossible for you to stay on at Fox News? And Bill, the same thing's going to happen to me in a year or two. Just wait. Maybe. Well, what's going through his... What? The que- this is my exact my point. The question. So, is it safe to assume the people at Fox were given a piece of information or some evidence that simply made it impossible for you to stay at Fox News? Wink and Bill. By the way, NBC's not. They know the same stuff about me. But I'm still here, and you're gone. <laughs> what goes through his mind when he asks these questions? We got you, Bill. We got you. You might have been the thing Fox was built on. We got you. And I've been doing everything you've been doing, Bill, and I'm still here. <laughs> but not now. I'm sorry, folks. I'm not apologizing. This I, this is what I wonder about. Do we have any more news? Yes, we do. Matt Lauer asking John Stewart about Louis C.K. Your good friend and colleague Louis yes. C.K. Yes. has been accused of and has admitted to yeah. some lewd acts involving women. What was the impact on you when you heard not only the accusations but his admission? And what will you think, John, about me when it is revealed what I've been doing, which makes what Louis C.K. did a piker? How do you do this? <laughs> you imagine being a bank robber and asking a guy that just got caught, and nobody knows you've ever robbed banks and you've gotten away with it, and you have to ask, sit there and ask these, these reprobates. <laughs> they got caught doing what you're doing. One more. Yes. This is CNN today. CNN, I told you, they're, and they're trying to do this even now. This is CNN trying to make the Matt Wauer story all about Trump. The president of the United States has been accused by 13 women, 12 named, one anonymous, of various forms of sexual misconduct. And now we're seeing consequences for Matt Lauer, for Charlie Rose. There will be consequences for Harvey Weinstein, for others. Yet, you know, not for Donald J. Trump. What a pivotal time it is to be a president when you really have seen a sea change. And he could be participating in leading this discussion. Instead, we're reading reports that he's denying what he even admitted to with the Access Hollywood tape. So it does seem a bit surreal that the leader of the country does not seem to be in lockstep with at least corporate America. That's not what you're trying <laughs> Doesn't seem to be in lockstep with the rest of corporate What? You're just mad that the guy hasn't been held accountable like you tried to make him held accountable, and yet all your buddies are dropping like flies. Did it ever occur to you that maybe the Trump women are making it up? Did it ever occur to you that all Trump's ever done is talk about this stuff? I mean, if NBC could have held on a Matt Lauer, they would have done it. If CBS could have held on a Charlie Rose, they would. Well, in Charlie's case, you know, I don't know. But we have to assume if they could have held on to these people, they would have done it.
We, I don't, I don't think these drive-by news execs enjoy this at all. They don't enjoy having to drop these people and and then listening to all the cat calls and the see I told you so's and so forth. Anyway, my friends, the the fun never stops. Only the program now and then. Back in a second. Back to the phone zoo, Albertville, Alabama. This is Jody, and I'm glad you waited. Welcome. Happy to have you here on the EIB Network. Hello. Rush Limbaugh? Yeah. I can't believe it. Ah. How are you? It's been years. I've been, I've been listening to you for years. I feel like you're one of my best friends. Well, I am. Yes, you are. We all um, are best friends here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to get off my And I just want you, if you are ever accused of sexual harassment, I will not believe it. Thank you, because I would not do that. Some women do, though. Really? Sure. <laughs> but anyway, I called to say that I am voting for Judge Roy Moore, and I'm so mad at Republicans that I could spit nails. They're such wimps. They, they, you know, they said that they're just going to take these women's word for it because they have no reason to doubt them. When, you know, women do sometimes, it's a dirty little secret, sometimes women use sex to get what they want. Really? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> but anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm sorry. I'm so excited I can't even keep my train of thought. Well, what what is it? The, the, the thing here with Roy Moore, correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, but the allegations against him are 40 years old, right? Yes. You know, 40 years ago, women in Georgia could get married when they were 14. I did not know that. I, yeah. Yeah. Yep, I had one right at my house at Thanksgiving. Was married in Georgia when she was fourteen. Is she and still? Not that it's good. Is she still married? Uh, actually, she was married for oh, a lot of years, but he passed away a few years ago. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. here's the thing. Uh, you find it fascinating that while they're just going to town, everybody on you know what a reprobate Roy Moore is. That while that's all of these Democrats are dropping like flies. I'll tell you what. Before they even. Even uh, the picture with uh, Al Franken came out, and they were talking about Roy Moore. And in my mind, I'm thinking, they have Al Franken up there. I mean, really? They're gonna, they're not gonna let us have Roy Moore. These Republicans say they're gonna try to not seat Roy Moore, and they've got Al Franken up there. I mean, everybody knew he was sleazy even before the pictures came out. Yeah, well, this is an insider versus uh, outsider thing again. Uh, Roy Moore is. Considered persona non grata simply because of his ideology, and they think he's a kook. You know, he he's uh, devoted to the Ten Commandments. There's weird things you know, like that, and people are made nervous by it in the uh, in the establishment. But it is kind of ironic. Look, the latest polling data that we had out of Alabama was yesterday, and it was a poll that has I think there are three previous releases of this poll, and it's, I, I can't remember the name of the polling outfit right now, but it seems to be taken seriously there. He's a five-point lead. And, you know, your re, your reaction to this, uh, Jody, how many people do you think are, are – are, there's, there's a backlash. All of this piling on Roy Moore is actually causing more people to maybe look positively at him, maybe think about voting for him. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally because, uh, well, we're just sick of being pushed around. We're sick of it. I, I tell you what, uh, I lived in Georgia years ago, and Newt, Newt Gingrich was my representative. Right. And then he had that big scandal, and they got rid of him. And I was mad. And then uh, Larry McDonald was my representative, and he got shot down out of the sky. And now Roy Moore, I want him in. Yeah, and not, that was K- K-A-L-007. That was, a, he was, uh, that was over the Kamchatka Peninsula. The Soviet Union shot down that airplane. Korean Airline 7, or 007. Anyway, Jody, thank you for the call. Appreciate the feedback. We've got to take a time out and be right back. Let's go back to the phones. I've got, I've got two other things I really want to get into here. I've got uh, more on net neutrality and the, this, this Pocahontas phony baloney consumer protection board and what it really was. I covered this extensively yesterday, but there's some update stuff on it today. But if I don't get to it, promise tomorrow here's nathan in monroe new york we head back to the phones how are you doing sir very well thanks for taking my call rush yes sir um i'd like to 
you know, going on your premise about uh, the media cracking up, I think it needs to be helped along. And the way to do that is to point out this, that the product of liberalism is really the breeding ground for this problem. We've been told that rape is not really about sex. It's about power. Right. And liberalism is about power and increasing people in position who can leverage that power to abuse people in this way. And, and I think it would be very helpful. I know the establishment wouldn't do it, but I think it would be very helpful for us to point out that these people who are committing these offenses fit the exact mold um, who are told, uh, you know, commit these kinds of offenses. They're, they're guys in power. They happen to be white guys in power. And lo and behold, they're all liberals. And lo and behold, liberalism leads to more well, guys. This, this is power. interesting. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. You, you may really be on this. Your, your premise starts with what, and by the way, this belief this this theory that rape or sexual abuse is not about sex, it's about power, can be traced back to a feminist author named Susan Brown Miller, who wrote a book in the 70s, and I forget the title of it, but if you wanted to date a feminist in the 70s, you had to read this, and you, you had to be conversant in it. I know, because I did. But this is where wow. the theorem was advanced that rape or sexual harassment is not about sex, it's about power. So your theory is that she's right, and that liberalism is the breeding ground for this power, and that we're actually seeing it on display. That yeah, the Charlie it's, Roses it's not... and the Weinsteins and all these guys are not doing this really for sex, they're doing it for the exertion of power over people. Well, if for no other reason, then their power affords them the opportunity. So if liberalism, would you could point out, or you could make the case that it is self fulfilling in this way that people get powerful and people start to misbehave because they're powerful and it's all on their side really right now yeah but how does that distinguish from say conservatives in power i mean power is power no matter who has it and where it is how would well, you distinguish I mean, it as a political ideology conservatism is technically the antidote where we're trying to reduce the institutional power and and give that back to the individual where they are more accountable whereas you know, liberalism, you're building bureaucracy and you're putting people in the position and and by virtue of that fact, putting them in the position to abuse women who work for them. Yeah, okay. And you know how it extends even further? You, then you use that power to uh, put a net around everything so that the word of it doesn't get out. For example, how about this news that there have been $15 million in payouts to silence women who have been abused or harassed by members of Congress. And there's now a big movement on to have these people named and identified. It is the power structure that keeps their names hidden. It is the power structure that keeps their deeds and activities hidden. But you're right about all this. Liberalism is about the pursuit of power for the purposes of using it against other people and for the advancement of your own agenda while liberalism portrays itself as fair and tolerant and open-minded and understanding and gentle and snowflakey and all of that it's a interesting point i like it the quest to further enable americans to understand liberalism and how liberalism actually breeds the circumstances for all of this liberal, male, abusive, power-related behavior. By the way, the Susan Brown Miller book title, Against Our Will. And I'm not kidding you. If you wanted to date a feminist woman in the 70s, you had to know about this book. And you had to fake like you understood it and uh, agree with it. And even then, the dates were blah. I mean, who wants to talk about this stuff? But back then, for women, this was emancipatory stuff. Who calls it the Time, the, yeah, Time Magazine, the book that changed the whole what structure? Se sexual discussion structure of the country. Yeah. Well, in their world, it probably was. But see, Time Magazine's world is not the American world. It, maybe at one time it was when Henry Luce ran it, but it's Time Magazine's never been a magazine for it about America. 
Time magazine's been forward about the establishment for I don't know how long. The U.S. Open. Take a look at the celebrities at the U.S. Open. The tennis tournament. Golf, totally different. The U.S. Open tennis tournament. You'll find Matt Lauer sitting in front of Charlie Rose. Sitting behind, who knows? I mean, it's, it's, it's the New York, it's the New York, Boston, Quarter, Washington, Corridor establishment. That's just one of the things they do. And then they have their polo tournaments out in the Hamptons. And then they do their, whatever else they do out there. But they, 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 they wherever they go, either Manhattan or the, Hamptons or Washington, they all gather and do the same things, and you can't be part of it. And the news media is so is all focused on what's going on within that world, and what happens in that world happens to be what's happening in America, in their world, except that it isn't. Back in a sec. Folks, I have to tell you, we've got a new procedure at RushLimbaugh.com this year for Christmas. Normally, we offer a free Christmas tree ornament with a new subscription or to Rush 24-7, the website, and the Limbaugh letter. We're doing something different. We're keeping the Tumblr, the special service Tumblr, as the premium for new subscribers, and the Christmas tree ornaments are better than ever, and they are on sale at the store, the EIB store at RushLimbaugh.com. Oh, this ornament is in honor of 30 incredible years on the radio. These ornaments, they are, they're simply stunning. They are a work of art. There is an American flag proudly placed in the center of the circle with America's anchorman, the EIB logo. My name is etched around the flag. We got to see these ornaments being hand forged where they're made right here in America and Pennsylvania, it was honestly incredible. And you would not believe how many steps are involved in making these quality works of art. You know, I love watching people who are the best at what they do. I love watching them do it. And I'm a production groupie. I'm a logistics groupie. It all starts in the art department with our design, and it goes to the master engraver where it gets cut. Then it gets hand-hammered, and it's polished. Every single ornament is hand-tied with a ribbon for you to hang on your tree. And these are all carefully handmade by Americans. There's no question this ornament this year is a -a one-of-a-kind collector's piece. And so rather than just make it available to new subscribers, anybody can get one simply by going to RushLimbaugh.com under the Store tab. And as brilliantly descriptive as I am, and as capable as I am of creating mental pictures, you still have to see this. And when you look at it, realize they're handmade, they're hand-forged, and they're all produced here in America. See it at RushLimbaugh.com, www.RushLimbaugh.com, under the Store tab. The ornaments are handmade. We... we uh, uh, we have a stock of supply here. They're not, they're, they're pretty hard to, to, to mass produce. That's how special they are. So we've got a current stock here. So make sure you get your order in if you are thinking of getting one this year. RushLimbaugh.com under the store tab. The Senate has confirmed President Trump's ninth federal judge making America great again. NBC editing Matt Wauer out of the televised coverage of the lighting of the Rockefeller Christmas tree. See you tomorrow, folks. Thanks so much for being with us today.